have a seat. Good morning, everyone. How's everybody feeling today? Feeling good, looking good. A lot of people here, packed house. Keep inviting people. I encourage you to do that. Keep inviting people. Let people know what God is doing here in this small little town. I just love it more and more. Just being, being able to meet the people here, being able to get to know you a little bit more. Keep inviting people and let them know what God is doing in this church and what God is doing in your life. Because I'm telling you, I drive around and I see again that people are lost. I see online that people are lost. And the only solution that's going to fix anything and everything is going to be Jesus Christ. And so if you're a believer this morning, you know that. You have the answer. We need to go out and tell everyone about that. Amen? Amen. A couple announcements before I begin this morning. Just so you know, we have a lot of things going on in the middle of the week. We have a Wednesday night Bible study for the adults. We have something for our teenagers and our kiddos. And even on Sunday nights as well, we have a Q&A se session for the adults. So if you have any questions during the message, make sure you write those babies down and come see it this afternoon. And then Melissa's doing a great job with our kids as well. So something for everyone, really. And if you've been coming on Wednesday nights, we're going through our Bible study methods class. And this past week, we were talking about Bible translation. So if you don't know anything about it, it's okay. But if you want one, let me know. This is a chart here that we were talking about on Wednesdays about the different translations. And so if you're interested in your translation and where it kind of falls about being a word for word or a very paraphrase, there's something there for you. And then also, since we are using the NASB on Wednesday night, which is a New American Standard Bible, some of y'all have been looking for one, so I have a link as well. I'm not getting any commission or anything like that, but if you guys are interested in looking for one of those Bibles that we use on Wednesday nights, all that information is there for you. But if you're a brand new guest, let me stop and welcome you. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad again. Maybe you haven't been here for whatever reason the last couple of weeks. Look up here. I am glad to see you, each and every one of you. Come here during the middle of the week. Yes, you can clap. I love that. Look at that. See? It's not just me, but the kiddos are excited as well to see everyone. It really is. Just know that I'm praying for you individually. I walk through the sanctuary and pray it, and I'm looking right now, and I say it all the time. I was, a church, I was in a church in Houston, and I don't know if it's just a Baptist thing or just Christians in general, but all of you sit in your assigned seating. So we do not have assigned seating here in this church, and do not flip out, church members, if someone is sitting in your seat, especially if they're brand new. Just let it slide this week. Get here early, and you'll, and you'll be fine next week. That's the last thing you want to do if you're a brand new guest is be kicked out by someone else because you're sitting in their seat. And so the only seat that matters is the, is the seat of Jesus Christ in our hearts. And so if you're brand new, welcome. We're glad that you're here. For our kiddos, we do have our bags that we like to pass out. This is just a way for them to be engaged during the message. And so if your kiddo needs one, let us know. Raise your hand. We'll get you one of those. But next week, I'm really excited because next week during worship time for kindergarten through third, we're going to now offer kids worship during worship time. So we're going to kick the kids out. That sounds bad, but we're not. At least through kindergarten through third, first for now. They'll go next door and we'll have a lesson for them as well. So this is during the worship time. And so we'll do that every week except the last Sunday of the month where we'll have something called Family Sunday where we all come together, even the kiddos. We have communion and all that good jazz. But just pray, because this is a prayer, I think, answered for many of us, and that just shows again that people are wanting to serve. And I'm going to tell you, if I'm going to be this pastor, or I am the pastor here at this church, thank God, but if I'm going to be here long, in which I want to be, everyone here at this church, and we look again, everyone here at this church, if you're a part of this church, you need to serve somewhere. And we're going to talk about that later on down uh, during the uh, Wednesday nights, on the Wednesday night service, we'll talk more about that. But really, and that's not something like, oh, I have to do, but something that you get to do. So serve, serve, serve. So let's go ahead and open up our Bibles, if we can, to First Peter this morning. A lot of announcements this morning, but that just shows again that we're just really engaged in our community and we want to see you grow. First Peter, guys. First Peter chapter 1, verses 17 to 25. That's where we're going to be this morning. I actually thought last week we were wrapping up chapter 1. 
I was wrong. I'm getting ahead of myself, just really excited how, how God is, again, is moving in this church. And I just see a hunger for God's word here. I see a hunger for truth. Do not get frustrated. You do not have all the answers. I don't have all the answers, but we, again, serve in the one who does. So do not get frustrated. I'm just praying that, that that same hunger that I have, that you'll have that as well. And it'll just go all over this place. But let's kind of walk through our recap that we do each and every week. In case you don't know, again, brand new, those watching online as well, we're walking through the book of First Peter. Peter wrote a couple of books in the New Testament, but today, or at least from now until Thanksgiving, we'll be walking through Peter. And so who wrote the book of First Peter? Peter? There you guys go, Peter. Thank you very much. And why? And we're talking about this on Wednesday nights for Bible study methods. It's not just reading the word of God, but it's knowing the context, knowing the bigger picture. Why is Peter writing this book? Well, you can see there he's encouraging them, those believers that are going through persecution. Same thing during the summer when we looked at the book of James. Remember, James was a lot about persecution and how we again can live and have this living hope. Peter and James are saying the same thing. These are brand new Christians. They're dedicated to Jesus Christ. They're living in Roman territory. So guess what? This is the pagan society. These people are not going to stand up for biblical truth. Just like today, when we stand up for biblical truth, we can expect, and as James would say, we should embrace when persecution comes our way. So he is encouraging them to stand firm is what Peter is talking about. Secondly, again, he gives them this three-part encouragement in the beginning of chapter 1. He tells them, first of all, who they are. They're chosen. They've been chosen by God. Their exiles scattered. Some of us have been rejected by our own family and friends. But by God, you have been chosen. You have value. You're not of this earth. So when Peter says your exile scattered, you're just passing through this place. This is not your home. You're looking forward to something that is coming. Peter tells them of what you have. Sometimes we forget what we have when we're going through trials. Yes, we have headaches. Yes, we have heartache. We have frustration. But Peter says this, no, you have something even better. You have a living hope. Tell your neighbor, you have a living hope. Hopefully you're telling them again with some some energy because you have that living hope inside of you. And it's not based on anything of this world because the things of this world are, I'm going to just tell you. But our living hope is rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Because Jesus has life and he rose from the dead. You too will have life and resurrection because of Christ. You can take that to the bank. That's a guarantee. And that's what Peter's trying to encourage the people that are going through persecution. And then he tells them, this is what you have coming. You have salvation. Now, of course, once you're saved in Jesus Christ, you are justified, which is a big theological term. That means that you are right with God. You see, we're all sinners because of what we've done, because we've sinned. But once you're saved, you are justified in the presence of God because of Jesus. Another big theological term, as you'll hear, sanctification. That is the process, day by day, moment by moment, that you're looking more like Jesus Christ. But Peter's talking about something that's going to come. And the big term is glorification. Everyone say glorification. glorification. And that's something we're looking forward to. That is the removal of sin. Now, we can't think about that right now in our little finite minds. It'll blow our minds. Because the things that we think about are selfish, sinful. But one day, there will come a time where sin will be removed from our lives. And Peter's saying this, hold on to that. Look forward to that. Yes, I know, again, you're going through persecution, but hope is on the horizon, what Peter says. He says, in order for this, this uh, living hope to take root in our lives, we need to change our attitudes a little bit. And so what does Peter say last week? He says, if you're going to be, and ha- if you're going to have this joy, I need you to be holy. And not just holy like anything else or anyone else, but be holy like God. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but through, again, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit working in our lives, we can be holy 
as Christ or God is holy. We just need to stop living in that ignorant life that we did before God came in our lives. So that's kind of where we're at already this morning. Now, Peter's going to transition a little bit, and he's going to talk about high cost. He's not talking about inflation now, but he's talking about the high cost that Jesus paid for your salvation. Did you know that Jesus paid a high price for you and I to have the opportunity to trust in him and him alone and have forgiveness? So that's what we're going to talk about. And because of this high price, here's a challenge for us. We now need to love one another the way that Jesus loved us. So I would say reach over and give a hug, but it's okay. Maybe we'll do that on the way out. So again, 1 Peter chapter 1, guys, is where we're going to be this morning. We're going to bite off verses 17 to 25, but we're going to start off reading verses 17 to 21. Word of God says this, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Underline that. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, silver and gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, verse 19, I love this, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now, in case you're brand new to the CCC family, that's Celebration Community Church, but it's just easier to say CCC. If you're brand new to the CCC family, you don't know maybe who I am. Again, Kevin Alvarez came here a little bit over three and a half months ago. My wife came, Yvette, daughter, our beautiful daughter, Madison. But some of you may not know that my wife and I actually have two other daughter. So let's bring up a picture. You can look down. It's not that embarrassing. It's a beautiful picture. Um, when they came down, this is, of course, my wife there on the left, my mama, because mama's got to come and check on her, her boy, make sure everything is okay, that you guys are treating me right, which y'all are. This is when they went to, in July, the um, Lincoln tomb. There's our daughter, Gabrielle, in the middle, Cassandra there on the right, and again, Madison. But what's interesting about this is we have two older, young adults, I put here in parentheses, young adult daughters, but it's funny now that we talk to them being, I don't know, about a thousand miles away in, in Texas, it's funny to see how they realize the high cost that things cost now that they're living by themselves. I see some of you saying, mm-hmm. And, and I'm not talking about like vacations and all these fancy things, I'm talking about simple things. I'm talking about gasoline prices, especially my oldest daughter, Cassandra. I mean, she's, what, 22, and she's still interested in gas prices all the time. Like, we drive through town, and she's like, oh, look, gas is cheap here, and gas is expensive there. Why? Because she sees the high cost in things like groceries. They go, or, or gasoline, but speaking of groceries, they go to the store, and they can see, again, how we would fill up the basket sometimes, and they get maybe half a basket or, or part of it, and they have nothing like macaroni and like detergent or something like that, and it's like $80. And so they see, again, the high price of everything all across the board. You see, this is a hard realization, but they realize, and now they appreciate everything that my wife and I have done for them, especially when they were young. So for those kiddos that are here this morning and teenagers, whoever is raising you and paying for your stuff, look at them right now and tell them, thank you. There'll come a time, there'll come a time when that stuff is gone. That's fine. That's fine. Just wait. If they didn't say thank you, you'll get it eventually. Don't worry. But this morning, as we, again, looking at 1 Peter by the time you walk away, this is my prayer, by the time you walk away this morning, you'll have a good grasp of the high price that Jesus Christ paid for you, for your, for your salvation, your forgiveness of sin, and then you will have a grateful heart for that towards God. And again, this is going to be able to change your attitude, because I think it all starts with a thankful attitude, doesn't it? If you're going to have a grateful heart to someone who's poured so much into you and giving you so much, I think it starts with your attitude. So this is why Peter, over the last couple of weeks, he's been encouraging uh, his, his audience and us to have a living hope. Correct? Everyone say living hope again. 
a living hope during persecution in a pagan society that you and I can relate to. And so Peter says this, if we're going to have living hope, we have to change our ways of that we're living, our attitude. And as I mentioned earlier during our recap, he says this, we need to adopt a new attitude of being holy like God is holy. Makes sense. If we are intimately involved with God, that means or it should mean if we're intimately involved, have a great relationship, we are obedient to God. The more that you are obedient to God, the more that you're learning about God, obedience should come naturally. You see how that all works together. And when you look at verse 17 here, you can see that these people, the audience that Peter is writing to, what do they call God? They don't just call him God, they call him what? Starts with F, ends with, there you guys got it, Father. Remember that the majority, there are some Jewish people there too, but most people that Peter are writing to are Gentiles. Now, these are non-Jewish people. They don't know again about this God. They don't see the big scope like the Jewish people did. The Jewish people, these are God's people. They don't understand all the customs yet. They're still learning about God. They call him God, but here in verse 17, we see they call him Father. Why? Because now they're understanding the more that they're learning about God, we can see that intimacy. We can see that authority in our lives. And this is what I'm telling you this morning. The more that you grow to know God, the more that you dive into your Bible, you're going to learn more about God. Verse 17, you see also they call him judge, don't they? You see, they know again that, yes, he's the creator overall. We can have intimacy with him. We can have a relationship with the creator, but he's also judge. So then we need to fear him. What does a judge have? Authority. Because he can lock your butt up or he can let you go and be free. So these people, these new believers, they see again, he's a father figure. He cares for me. He loves me. But at the same time, if I mess with him, he's judge, he's rightful judge, and he can put me away if needed. Guys, you can have a relationship with God Almighty. I love just diving into the Word of God, and I see all these things that God did, especially in creation, how he set things here. He did this. You can talk to him even right now. And that is what sets God apart from everyone else. And so again, going back to verse 17, Peter is pretty much telling them this. Because you are a foreigner, remember, you're just passing through. Do not fear your trials but fear God. Now, we hear that word thrown out a lot in Christianity. You need to fear God. And with Halloween right around the corner, I'm not talking about being fearful like a Halloween, like, ah, you're scared, things like that. But what kind of fear is Peter talking about? A respectful, being reverent towards God. The more that you know about God, the more that you're willing again to live for God. Be respectful to God. This is the kind of attitude, again, and it's healthy. Let me tell you, I was not the best child all the time. And one person I feared was my father. And what else did I fear about my father was his big old Texas-sized belt buckle. My daddy was a cowboy. At least he thought he was a cowboy. He had this big old belt buckle that was as big as a hubcap on a car. You're laughing, but I was not laughing at the time. I was laughing when my mom would try to discipline me. But no, when I seen daddy drive up, all dad had to do was take that belt off. And he'd whip us with the end of that belt buckle. Not the belt, but the belt buckle. You see, I feared my dad. I have respect for my dad. Because I knew he, again, he was the one in charge. This is what Peter's audience is seeing now. They're growing. They understand he has authority. He loves me. And he wants the best things for me. Now, a little bit again, not just talking about the father, but now you see Peter transition to talking about the son. He says the son paid a high price for our sins. Now, that's a very good question to think about this morning. Do you really understand the high price that Christ paid for our sins? There's another picture that we'll put up here, and I really want you to focus on this picture here. Just think about that. Just Look at his face. Do you really understand the high price that Christ paid to give us the opportunity to have eternal life? 
You see, in the Gospels, we'll see, we see this come to life. In the Gospels, we see Jesus Christ hanging on the cross. And remember, in the Gospel, he cries out to his father. He says what? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I see some of you again nodding your heads so you understand. Why have you forsaken me? I wrote it down in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, but it's on in all the Gospels. But do you understand again why Christ was saying that in that situation? Do you know why? Christ is, again, holy and perfect. He's 100% God, 100% man. He's the only one that could pay for our sins. But in that moment when Christ cried out to God, because God turned his back on his son. Now, listen to what I'm saying. You know why he did that? Because God looked at his son as sinful. Blows our mind. Because he's the perfect lamb. But in that moment, Jesus realized that the father turned away from him. Because he could not be in the presence of a holy, perfect God. That is the sacrifice that Christ, look again. That is the high price that Christ was willing to pay for you and I. And we looked again, I think, a couple of weeks. For the joy set before him, even though, again, that must have been shameful, humiliating, Christ still thought of you personally and the opportunity for you to have eternal life. Even though, again, he was separated for a moment from his father, he was thinking of you. And because of this, because of what Christ went through, we, you and I, should now want to and should have a desire to go out and live for Jesus Christ. We should not take what he did very lightly. Should we? We should not. It was not paid by silver and gold. Christ didn't go up and say, here you go. I'm going to give you a blank check and just fill it out. No, he didn't. He did, but he did it with his body. He did it with his blood. A ransom was paid. And so again, because of this, Peter is saying this. You need to be foreigners. Stop living, a, living again the way that you lived before God came in your life. Look what he calls it in verse eight, 18. He calls it an empty Gentile life. Even Peter knows. He said, look, what Christ did was valuable. Stay away from this empty way of life that you used to live without God. This is beautiful. You've been chosen. Right there. Christ thought of you. Beautiful. The one again who was there at creation thought of you. You've been chosen, Peter says. Christ was chosen by God. When we read again in Genesis and we see Adam and Eve messed up in the Garden of, in Garden of Eden, how they eat the fruit, God already had a plan set up. He knew what was going to happen. He was chosen, Peter says, before the creation of the world. His death, his burial, his resurrection was all part of God's perfect plan. And because God executed it perfectly, you and I have the opportunity today, if you haven't done it already, to trust in Jesus Christ, to have that living hope inside of you all the time, not just some days, but all the time. This perfect plan. In other words, this. Because Christ has a victory, guess who else that rolls over to? You and I. Because Christ has a victory, you and I have the victory. Someone say amen to that. Amen. Let's go to verse 22 to 25 now. Because look, now that Peter is doing more of the instructional, instructional, I guess, uh, information he's given us, now he's going to move over again to more applicational, more practical. So let's look at verses 22 to 25 real quick. Peter says this, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, this is again the practical part. Now that, again, that you've looked at that picture of Jesus Christ, you understand the high price, this is what he says. Love one another deeply from the heart. And this is what we're going to talk about this morning. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures how long? forever, and this is the word that was preached to you. So again, last week, Peter was saying this. He talked about adopting a new 
attitude, correct? Adopting a new attitude. This was living holy like God is holy. Now, he's talked about the, the, the believer's responsibility towards God. This is what we should do. Have a new mindset, a new attitude towards God. Now, we need to love one another as the way that Christ loved us. When you looked at that picture there, think again about what Christ did. That was sacrificial love. So Peter says this, now we need to love. It's the believer's responsibility to love one another. And if you look at the verse, the end of verse 22, yeah, the end of verse 22, Peter's going to sum up this command that he's talking about in one little short phrase. And he says this, love one another deeply from the heart. Why? Because if we're going to love other people, we first need to love God, don't we? Because God is the source. Now look, when Peter says we need to love one another, this is where we probably need to stop a little bit. Because the way that we think of love is probably not what Peter is thinking about. Because we say, we use that word love very loosely, don't we? We say we love pizza. We love Mexican food. We love our family. We love our friends. We love, uh, especially with homecoming yesterday, the boys are going to say, girls, I love you. Don't listen to that junk. Don't listen to that. They just throw that very loosely. That wasn't even in my notes, but I just thought about it. Very loosely. You see, those are the things that we use that word very loosely today. But this is not what Peter is talking about. Let's go to the next slide there. Because I wanted to talk about something called agape love. Everyone say agape love. The word agape compared to what we think of love today, again, we think of love just letting someone go first before us. We think about love as as maybe liking their, their social media posts and things like that. But Peter is talking about a whole new level of love. And this is what he wants us to do. Because this is rooted in what Jesus did for us. Agape love is of God and it only comes from God. When you look at 1 John 4 verse 8, it says simply that God is what? God is love. So you can think about anything and try to define love the way the world does, but John is going to say this. Matter of fact, John, many people will call John the disciple of love because he talks a lot about love. He's seen it firsthand through what Jesus Christ did. You see, God doesn't merely love. He is love. He's the source of love. And everything that God does comes from him being love. Think about his mercy towards you. God could just look at you and go, and just wipe you off. He should for some of us, but he doesn't. Why? Because he loves you. His compassion towards you, he again could go and just put all this wrath on you because you deserve it, but what does he do? Instead, he is patient with you. He gives you and shows you love. Now, when it comes to agape love, Love, this agape love, also describes the way that you and I should love God. Let's go to the next scripture there. Many of us have heard this before. Luke chapter 10, verse 27. We see a man talking to Jesus Christ, and he's like, how how, how am I going to love my neighbor? How should I again obtain eternal life? Jesus tells him this, love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. Love God, agape love, sacrificially love God with all that you are. It should be exhausting in a good way. I know one of the first times I met you guys and I was doing a Q&A, I mentioned that I love to exercise. You're like, why does this guy like to exercise? I go and I exercise because it makes me feel good. It gives me energy. It's exhausting, yes, but I feel so much better because of it. When we go and love other people, it should be exhausting, but we see the benefit of it. Don't you feel good when you go love somebody else? You should be nodding your head. What about when someone loves on you and you don't deserve it? Don't you feel good? Everyone should be going like this, like little bobbleheads, right? You should. We all do. And this is what Peter, this is where Peter's going. He's like, all the knowledge that you have, you've been chosen. You're not of this world. You have a living hope. You have an inheritance waiting for you. 
Salvation is coming to you. With everything that we have, adopt a new attitude. Go and love other people. Love them the way that Jesus loved us. And this is the great question I'm going to ask later on tonight. But when you think of the cross, what comes to mind? Yes, we can think, oh, it's brutal, it's shameful, it's disgusting, it's bloody, it's gory. But what if you flip that a little bit? Isn't there a song or a hymn that says the beautiful, the, 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 the beautiful cross? And we see again, you flip it a little bit. How is the cross to you? Is it sacrificial? Undeservedly? I, I would say that. You don't deserve what Christ did for you, yet he did it for you. But think about it really. Don't give me your answer. Say that for tonight. But whatever you're thinking in your mind, a positive thing, a beautiful thing about the cross, then what you need to do, my challenge to you this morning, is go live it out now. If that's your word of a day, the word of the week, the word of your life, go and love other people because they need it. You and I need it. We need to love people. So can we again be the exception here at Celebration? Because I'm going to go and say this. When it comes to agape love, I'm going to say in the church as a whole, not just here, but in the church as a whole, there is probably less agape love that's found in the church. And that is sad. Why? Because we have the perfect example of what, lo what, what love is. Look at that cross there. If I can move to the side... That right there is your example. And guess what? The cross is empty. Why? Because he was thrown in a tomb. And guess what? I've been there, and I looked, and I peeked, and the tomb is empty. You know why? Because Jesus is not there. Shame, shame. When the church has the perfect example of love, and we're not doing that. So, celebration, can we be the exception and love your neighbor today. Everyone say amen to that, please. Thank you, thank you. Live unconditionally to those. Go and tell your neighbor, I love you, man. Whatever it is, just go and share Jesus Christ. And I love how Peter works it all out as we kind of land the plane this morning. Kind of short and simple message this morning. It's short and simple, but it's hard for us to go and apply. Because look what Peter's saying. It all ties together. He says, go and love people like Jesus loves us. And when we do that, you'll have joy in your life. You'll have a living hope in your life. Why again? Even in this spite of, or even being in persecution because of what Christ has done for you. You've been born again, Peter says. Not by anything that you've done. Not by anything that we can buy. But by the living, look what he says, living imperishable word of God. Do you understand that the Bible, the Word of God, is living and active? It's not just some book on your bookshelf. For some of us, it may just be. But again, it is living. It is active. It is moving again in yours and our life. And I have a scripture to back us up real quick. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Maybe you've heard this before. Maybe you've seen it before. Let's read it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Talk it again and backing me up about how powerful scripture is. It says, for the word of God is what? Let's bring it up there. We gotta pause for effect, I love it. Oh, he's going like this, his hands are off. Okay, well, I'm gonna read it right here. For the word of God, Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, it is alive, everyone say alive. alive. It is active, everyone say active. active. There we go, just like we want everyone here. The word of God is alive and it's active. Check this out, it says it's sharper than any double edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Here's where I want to end. Did you know the majority of people here this morning are packing heat? Now, I know some of you are physically packing heat, if you know what I'm talking about. But if you have a Bible this morning, you're packing heat. When you look at what Hebrews said, and so many, uh, so many people will say that Paul wrote it, but I'm talking about the Word of God. It is alive. It's active. It can affect. It can move mountains. And the enemy Satan does not like it. It is a deadly weapon even towards him. It's not outdated. It's not irrelevant to what the world says and thinks. 
It is alive and it's moving. And I don't know about you, but I know I can say it at least if it wasn't for the word of God, I don't even want to know where I would be. And some of you would say the same thing as well. What the word of God has done and how it has changed our lives. Someone once said this about the word of God. It's the instrument that God uses to produce new birth. It endures forever. And so as Peter is talking to these people, and they're going through persecution, which may seem like forever, hold on. Have living hope. You have a living hope through Jesus Christ. And why? It is not going to be taken away from you. It is imperishable because of the word of God. It has happened because of the word of God. As he ends there, he says, what, people die? He says, flowers die? But the word of God lives forever. Again, everyone say forever. forever. So Peter is saying, everything I've said about a hundred times, if we're going to have a living hope during persecution today, our salvation that was brought by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's rooted in the word of God, the imperishable word of God. Hold on to that. As I was saying this morning, hunger for that. Crave for that. And your lives, I guarantee you, will never be the same. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this short, simple message, but just so much punch into it. When we look again about the word of God and how it endures forever, it is an imperishable. It doesn't spoil. It doesn't fade, just like our inheritance that's waiting for us. And so, Lord God, as we focus again on your word, and I know right now that your word is penetrating our hearts and minds. It is stirring up inside of us. The Holy Spirit, again, is allowing us to see things, to see truth, to see our spiritual condition. And some of us, some of us, again, have not trusted in Jesus Christ. And because of that, the same way that God looked at Jesus and turned his back again because of sin, guess what? We, again, are looked at as sinful in the eyes of God. But because Jesus Christ did what he did on the cross, and he was crucified, he was put in that tomb, and then three days later, he busted out of that conquering death, and then eventually ascending to the right hand of the Father, sitting down, knowing again that everything had been done. It is finished. We can trust again in the good work of Jesus Christ. We are then again because of the blood, as we talked about, the high price that Christ paid, the blood of Jesus has made us new. We are now able to be in the presence of God because of Jesus Christ. That is all rooted again in our faith and what the word of God says. And so, Lord, we know that you're moving in this place. We see it happen all the time, week after week. Everyone just being faithful to what you're doing. I pray that if someone has not done that, here in person, those watching online, they will make the most important decision that they will ever make in their lives. Because it's either two places, in the presence of God or away. In the presence in heaven or away in hell for all eternity. Lord, thank you for what you've done. We know again that you're moving in this place. And we ask and I plead that people will respond, respond to you. Lord, we thank you. We love you as always. We put everything we do into your hands and into your mighty beautiful hands, Lord. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Short and simple. I love it. That's one thing I tell people all the time. I'm not going to push God's word. If it's long, if it's long, if it's short and short. I don't want you to walk away and say, that was nice. I want you to walk away and say, that was nice and I want more. And what are you going to do today? You're going to go and you're going to love someone the way that Jesus loves us. So as we continue to worship this morning, I want to see people on their, on their feet, if you're able to. Hands raised. Shout out to the Lord. Let him know again that you are grateful, as my children are now, that they're grateful for the things that I've done and my wife and I have done. Let your daddy know right now how much you are grateful for him, and let us fill this sanctuary with praise to God. Can we do that? Amen.